So, Salamat Pagi, Salam Sajatra to all our colleagues who have just joined, our respected colleagues from different faculties. I'm, I think WebEx is slow today because I'm using two terminals here and I have under terminal here and the local area network is a bit slow. So I think we have to wait for our colleagues to log in. Okay. But I think we will start now and then the session is being recorded and your attendance is being recorded as well for the IDP points. So welcome to this uh, training session. Today we are going to focus on hands-on training session. Now, my name is Kenneth. I am uh, at the Center for E-Learning and I'm assisted today by our technical staff who is a technical expert, which is uh, Miss Nora. She's with me right now. And I will guide you today to the step-by-step -step process of registering at the UMS Open Educational Resources Repository. There, I will uh, guide you through the various processes because registration there requires a manual login and manual registration. Some of you may be having accounts if you have attended other IDP training and some of you may not. Now, within UMS, we have two additional systems uh, besides Smart V3. One is the UMS OER repository, okay? And we also have a MOOC platform uh, which is being developed. So. At the Center for eLearning, we have three basic systems. The first is the learning management system, which caters to our students. The second uh, management system is the OER. So this OER platform actually caters to the public. And we also have the MOOC platform, which is catering to our students and alumni currently, but we will extend it to the public as time goes by. Okay, so today I'm going to introduce you to these systems. But before I begin, I want to ask you a simple question. I'll just put a poll up there. Just one question, because it helps me to understand your learning needs. Okay, so this is what we do, and I open the poll. Okay, there's a simple question which I'm asking you, which is, which is, um, are you aware of the concept of the open licenses? Creative Commons, open licenses. Are you aware of that concept? That's all which I need to know. Okay, so I've got some answers. So yes, and there is, uh, most of you are aware because you may have attended prior IDP courses, but I have to explain to you this concept clearly because sometimes it, there is a gray area, which is the crossover between intellectual property and the open licensing. I'll explain that to you so that throughout your career at UMS, you don't have that problem of the open licensing and uh, copyright. Okay, these this issues can come up eventually. Now, our coordinator for our OER, we have a person in charge is Apuan Eugenia, Ida Edward. She's uh, currently today, she's in a retreat with her faculty. So she is our coordinator for the OER and the MOCs. Okay, so you, I will, uh, anything which you need to find out about OER and MOCs, you can either ask me or you can consult with her. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, so you should see the screen now. So today we are going to focus on the Open Educational Resources Repository at UMS. But before I focus on the OER and take you through the step-by-step -step procedure, where you, are, where you will register yourself and you will learn how to upload content. I have to explain the basis for the OER. What is this OER and why is it important? And uh, when can you use OER and when you should not use OER? Okay, so. Okay, so First, we have to understand the concept of OER. Then we learn how to create or generate an open license. Then we learn how to upload content in the OER repository. And I will also guide you through what can and what cannot be hosted and how to link your content to your SMPPI. Okay, so we have our system here, the UMS um, system, which records all our publications and content. So the OER is also considered one of your content. And when you are fi filling up your ELNPT uh, forms at the beginning end of the year, which is the beginning of the next year, you will have to go into this uh, OER repository and you can actually get recognition for your content as OER because all content which you create at UMS is considered intellectual property, whether it's a publication which is peer reviewed, non-peer reviewed, an article in a journal, an article in a newspaper, 
it's all content. Even a YouTube video is content. So that's how we consider content. Okay, so it's classified in different categories. So OER is one of the contents. And this can be used to improve your CV. Okay, so the concept of open educational resources is something which is being promoted globally. And there are many foundations, for example, Hewlett Packard Foundation, which promotes this concept and they engage with the UNESCO in training uh, and uh, capacity building across the world. Why is this concept of open educational resources becoming relevant today is because of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So we are looking at the development of the entire world as opposed to development of individual countries or member nations. Okay, so we look at the whole world. Now what's happening in the world is that the SDGs actually focus on elimination of disparity. This disparity primarily is disparity in terms of the access to education and access to wealth. Okay, so of course there are other access to food and clean water and so on, but we are interested in the access to education and the access to wealth, which comes when you are educated. Now, when you look at education, we are fortunate that in many countries in Asia, we have access to education, but many countries in the world are having no access to education. Okay, you look at certain countries, for example, which are in the war zone, like Syria, like Palestine, or middle in the middle of Africa, you'll have countries which have no access to education, either because of geopolitical factors or because of the uh, internet connectivity. So this is why United Nations, UNESCO proposed the OER. OER enables all people across the world to access education in an open manner. Open means they don't have to pay for it. Of course, they have to pay for the uh, download in the internet, but they don't have to pay for the content itself. Now, this concept of OER is a little bit revolutionary in terms of the context of the higher education because in higher education uh, systems in our university, there are two types of content. One content is the one which we get copyrights and we generate income. The second type of content is the content which is put in the open access, which is accessible to all. This is free. It does not give any um, benefit to the university beyond the reputation. Okay, so that's why you need to be judicious when you decide what content to put in OER repository because you may have commercial content and this will uh, be a choice which has to be made by the individual lecturers or the individual academicians. So it all comes down to the right to education. Now, where did all of this start? This actually starts with MIT and there are many other um, areas which uh, other universities have focused on, but MIT is the one which started the MIT Open Courseware. Today you can go to the MIT Open Courseware website and you can download content, you can reuse their content all with attribution. So this is like an entire database of content which you can reuse. It's videos, lecture notes, lesson plans, and uh, the assessments. You can all access this at the MIT Open Courseware and you can reuse it. Provided that you uh, acknowledge the source, which is MIT Open Courseware. Okay, now we I will introduce you to the concept of intellectual property in the context of your career as an academician at UMS. And what is this intellectual property? Intellectual property and open access or the uh, open licenses are entirely different. In Malaysia, when we file for intellectual property, we actually have a set of show you the sets, subsets of the intellectual property. So you may all be aware of patent. So you can file for a patent in Malaysia. So we have a we have patents which you can file for your inventions. You have industrial design, which are design layouts. For those of you who are from engineering background, we have copyrights, which is related to your copyrighted material, geographic indicators. For example, you have in Sabah, you have Sabah tea or Tenom coffee. Okay, these are geographical indicators. So these are specific indicators which you can file for an IP. Then you have the integrated circuit design. For those of you who are from electronics field, you can file your IC circuits in uh, 3D format, what they call the, because IC is actually three dimensional designs, then trademarks and trade secret. So these are the entire spectrum of the 
content which you can file in Malaysia under the Intellectual Property Act. Okay, so we have all these contents. Now everything beyond that can be filed, uh, can be actually shared using an open license. Okay, so some of you may be aware of the concepts uh, of the patent and copyright if you have attended other training sessions. But this is basically the range of the uh, intellectual properties which you can file for in the UMS. Okay. So you have to go to the Intellectual Property Corporation of Malaysia, what we call the MIPO and file this. Now you don't go directly. In UMS, we go through the PPI. We go through the PPI and we um, have a form. We have Borang IP1 and IP2 and we file for the intellectual property. Now this is something which you need to do before you decide to go in for open licensing. So if you decide to file for intellectual property with MIPO, you don't uh, publish it with an open license because it will challenge your IP. Okay. Now, why is this concept of IP in, important in a university in the current context? One of the reason is because the IP itself, right, is your intellectual property. Now, the way you look at it is uh, we, are, we are here doing a particular service or a job. We get paid for the job and the content which we created during the process of work is actually intellectual property. It can be an image, it can be a lecture note, it can be a content which is like a, a industrial design. It's This is all IP. So at, as education institutions, we are constantly creating or engendering new IPs and this needs to be acknowledged. For example, you created IP, you created content, but you don't get acknowledgement. It's actually a not an efficient process because you are wasting your time and your energy in creating content which will not be recognized. That is why at every opportunity you must try and develop or get your IP documented. Now for this documentation of IP we have of course the MIPO and the OER repository. Okay now for OER the definition is very broad. It can be any kind of material. For example, you are creating a poster. You go for a conference and you have to prepare a poster. That poster can be deposited in the OER repository. Okay, there is no issue regarding poster. So I would suggest that before you go for a conference, you generate a PDF file and you deposit in the OER repository. Now, the advantage of depositing your content in the OER repository is that it becomes searchable on all search engines. For example, you look for your poster on Google search engine from anywhere in the world, you will find that poster or that content. Now, in addition to the, uh, the general uh, OER's content, which is the video, the uh, printed uh, lecture notes, or which are in the digital format, or maybe eBooks, or even the voice audio files, poetry, poems, are all part of the OER uh, spectrum. Okay, So in addition to that, you have the software, those of you who develop software, open source software and open data. These are all part of the OER as well. Okay, So in the OER repository, you can also give links to your data and you can also ensure uh, upload software, the, uh, the, the scripts or the codes, but you must ensure that the links are not broken. For example, if you give a link to a open data, you have to ensure that the link is maintained. So these are all uh, avenues for you to get recognition at UMS. Now, what are the different categories of open licenses? So we have one side, we have public domain or PD, which is CC0. CC0 means the content creator for public domain does not want any recognition. They just want their image to be embedded in some, uh, some uh, location or in di digital format or in a print format and they give it as public domain. Now, what are these public domain images? Generally, if you have an image which is very old, more than 10 years old or 20 years old, it may go into the public domain because it does not have any kind of attribution because your copyrights have a limited time. So after your uh, copyright duration is over, you, it will go into the public domain. So public domain can be shared, reused, downloaded, remixed without any kind of referencing to the original a content creator. Okay, so usually uh, the government will re release images of the, for example, the meetings or the uh, press release. These are some of them are in the public domain. Now, as uh, uh, employer employees of a institution which is funded by public domain, 
technically all our content should be in the open uh, open license category so we have we are because we are paid by the government to create content so that content uh, naturally should be in the open category means all the public our stakeholders our students and the public have access to that at all times that's the way that's the philosophy of the open licensing or even the legal aspect of open licensing now when you put uh, content in the public domain you will not get recognition directly no one will cite you because it's public domain they don't have to cite you so you have what is known as a creative commons so creative commons is a license whereby you deposit you create content but you get recognition or citation for your content copyright on the other hand if somebody wants to reuse your material they have to pay you okay that's uh, that's the spectrum so you have public domain creative commons and the copyrights copyrights is the extreme way of protecting your content for a financial gain so this is creative commons now i will open a site for you which is the creative commons website so i just open up creative commons This is the Creative Commons website. You can access it. Now, what is this Creative Commons? Uh, creative Commons is a website where a lot of content is contained. You can search for CC images, which are the CC images which you can incorporate in your lecture notes. You can look for video files as well, and you can find uh, repositories of data in the open, uh, the uh, open access with open access licensing. Now. If you look at videos themselves, if you want to reuse, for example, content from YouTube or Vimeo or any other platform, you will notice that there are two types of content in YouTube. One is shared under the open license and one is shared as a standard YouTube license. So if you have a, something like a CCBY video in YouTube, it will have a, a license which says Creative Commons Attribution, CCBY. These videos you can download, reuse and remix and share. Some of the content creators do not want to share their content using open licensing. They will set up a standard YouTube license, which means it is almost like the copyright. It's based on the country to country. But in Malaysia, if you cannot download content from YouTube, which is um, shared under standard YouTube license and reuse it without the permission of the content creator. So this is the different categories of licenses which we have, uh, which we are currently encountering with. And now these are the different kinds of licenses or the different types of licenses. So they range from this one here at the top, which is the CCBY, Creative Commons with Attribution License, to the which is uh, almost open because all you need to do is to cite the original source. So this is called CCBY. So what it means is Creative Commons with Attribution. And then you have the extreme uh, license over here, which is on the bottom of the right hand side. So you have CCBY, so it means attribution. NC means non-commercial and ND means no derivatives. So this is a very restrictive license. I will show you how to generate this um, codes using the Creative Commons license generator. But for now, you be aware of the different types of the licenses. So you have different types. For example, you have CCBY. Then you have CCBY, which is CCBY share alike, which means that they can use the content, but they have to share it using the same license. Then you have the CCBY non-commercial, they can use your content but cannot commercialize it and you have the entire spectrum which goes on until no derivatives. No derivatives means your content cannot be edited and reused. So it has to be used in its true format or as it was. Okay, so if you look at our UMS OER repository, go right to the bottom, you will see our license is CC, BY, non-commercial and share alike. So that means the content on UMS OER will require the user to attribute you. For example, your student reuses your lecture notes. They will have to attribute you, but they can only share it alike, means under the same license and they cannot commercialize it. So somebody who wants to commercialize, for example, you have a lecture on um, art and you have a lot of beautiful images and a student wants to reuse or a pub member of the public wants to reuse it. They can reuse your lecture, but they cannot charge a fee for that lecture. Okay, so it cannot be commercialized. So those of you who are teaching commercial courses with the, um, for example, a commercial uh, content, for example, your, your faculty is using income, having income generation courses, those you don't deposit in OER because it means that it, or else you cannot commercialize that particular course or that particular content. 
Okay, so this is the least restricted license as I mentioned earlier. It's the CC BY license where you can you are free to reuse and remix, but cannot commercialize the content. And you have the most restricted license, which is the CC BY NC ND. Now you will ask me, what is the legal uh, aspect of this license? Okay, can you sue anyone? Actually, uh, if they if you find people reusing your content and charging for it, you can actually take action against them because it was shared under a non-commercial license. I will guide you through this process once I finish this presentation, which is the licensing, uh, creating the license or generating a license and how to use metadata. We will go through that once I finish this presentation. Now, one of the underlying philosophy of OER is curation and reuse. Now, suppose I created content in my subject area of expertise, and you are another lecturer somewhere in another university, or even maybe in UMS, who reuses my content. Now, every time you reuse the content, you actually curate the content. So, for example, if I have created lectures and there are certain mistakes or inconsistencies in that, you can actually uh, curate that. You can uh, Re, uh, resubmit the OER with modifications, provided that shared under a license, which is CCBY. So you can resubmit a lecture. Oh, for example, if you have historical data and the data has changed over time. So five years later, you download my lecture note, which is uh, reporting on historical data, and then you add some more data to that. So you complement the data set and then you resubmit to the OER repository. So this is actually called repurposing of OER material. Now, what you should note as a lecturer, this was an uh, issue which was raised many times, is that we cannot repurpose copyrighted material. Okay, so be clear on this. You cannot, for example, we are using a textbook in our class and we photocopy the slides or we scan it and we convert it to a PowerPoint slide because now with software, you can convert everything to a PowerPoint slide. You cannot repurpose that. So uh, the copyrighted material cannot be repurposed. But OER content can be repurposed with attribution. That is one of the advantages of OER. Copyrighted material, you'll have to go to the uh, original content creator and ask him or her permission, official written permission, in order to reuse it. Now, <laughs> the OER philosophy is generally to share. So if you're not willing to share, or if there are some reasons for, for, for which you don't want to share, for example, commercial reasons, then don't share it in the OER repository. Now, our OER repository is accessible at oer.ums.edu.my. Now, when you, when you are using this repository, you cannot log in using your standard user ID and password, which you use for a single sign-on system like, such as HR Online. You need to generate a separate user license and password. I will guide you through that process. Now, our OER is as I mentioned earlier, it's a Creative Commons attribution with uh, non-commercial use and share alike. Now, we will guide you through the process of registration and uh, our administrator, Ms. Nora is here and she will, uh, you will receive an email from her. So I will guide you through that process and I will show you how to update your profile and deposit content. Okay, I will guide you step by step. Now, how is the UMS OER database categorized? Now, if you search for UMS OER using Google, you can key in a title. For example, you can uh, Kadazan Dusun Culture or Saba uh, uh, Musical Instruments. You can just Google that. Okay, at OER, and then you will, you will have access to the OER. Uh, if there's a content in the OER, you will find that content over here. Now, what the OER is essentially is a database. This database is maintained at our JTMK in UMS. Okay, it's a physical database stored here. Now, every time you access the content, the traffic is recorded. So we know who's downloading the content and the IP address and so on and so forth. So we can we monitor that data as well. Now, the way the data is stored is in the form of what is known as a community collection. Now, we, as we, you know, you may be aware that we use uh, faculties, institutes, pusat centers, and so on, units, and so on and so forth. But for the OER repository, 
the category is called collection. So it's categorized in the form of collections. So in the collection, we have specific types of collections. So these are the types of collections which are permitted. E article, for example, you wrote a one page article or maybe a 10 page article, which is on a document. Okay, you convert it to PDF, you can upload it here, it becomes an e article. Then you have ebooks. Ebooks you can create with um, content creation software. You can, uh, or you can ask us at the Center for e learning if you need to create an ebook, you can contact us and we will assist you in the creation of the ebook. You have e notes. So all our lecture notes, for example, this lecture note, which I'm using just right now, can be deposited as a PDF file and it becomes an e note. Your, your lecture, your laboratory, for example, those of you who conduct uh, field work and laboratory work, all your laboratory guides or your field guides can be deposited here as e notes. Then you have the e poster, those of you who attend conferences, and finally, you have educational videos. Now, the thing about videos at the OER, the OER cannot upload large files. You cannot upload large files and store them at the OER. So, what you need to do is for educational videos, you need to create the file in uh, an uh, external platform, for example, YouTube or, or the Vimeo and so on and so forth. You need to create a license or assign a license which is open to that and then you can deposit the link in the OER repository. So that's the difference between text and uh, or basically text files and the video files. And now you can deposit articles videos as links, lecture notes, ebooks, and e-articles. But you cannot deposit in this system your peer-reviewed publications which are in Springer or the um, LCVR Springer, all those, you cannot deposit here because that is a violation of copyright. So sometimes we publish and then we get our PDF copy and then that, that, lies, that uh, article is under subscription. That one you cannot deposit here because then we will be flagged for copyright violation. That one you send, ask the library to host it on the library repository for the content. Okay, now these are the terms and conditions or the do's and don'ts of the OER system. The first one is you cannot upload copyrighted material on the OER repository. So no copyrighted material that includes books by authors, including by yourself. Okay, suppose I write a book and I submit the book draft to Penerbit UMS. So UMS uh, publisher will publish that book. Then I say, I want to upload it UMS OER by scanning it. You can't do that. So that's a violation of the copyright. Second one is intellectual property and potential IP. So suppose you feel that your content or something which you have created in your workplace, for example, you are doing scientific research or you're doing some creative work and you want to file intellectual property for that, like, patent or MIPO. That one, again, you don't deposit at the OER or else when, you are, when your work is, uh, when you file for IP, that, uh, that work will be cited as what is known as prior art and they will not grant you IP. So be careful with that because once you deposit something in the OER repository, you cannot retract it back again. So this is one thing which you should be careful with because if you retract it back, uh, first of all, we can't retract it back because in the open, open license category. So we have to think clearly before you deposit. Okay, so don't try and deposit anything which is potential IP, something which you feel which will have IP uh, intellectual property value in the future. Then we do what is known as plagiarism check. So generally before we deposit, you will have to do a plagiarism check to ensure there's no plagiarism. Then you have to contribute, uh, ensure that you acknowledge all the authors. For example, if your article has three or four authors, we have contributed to that either the content itself or maybe the field trip and so on and so forth. Please ensure that you have the author's contribution listed there because if you don't do that, someone may raise issues regarding the intellectual property and the sharing of the OER content. Then you have students projects. So you can deposit students project except the final year projects. The final year projects go through the library. But I can show you examples from different faculties where there are students' assignments, some of the very good assignments with good images and good quality text, of course, after checking for plagiarism, are deposited in the OER repository. You can also deposit repurposed material. For example, uh, uh, sites such as SlideShare, you can download your lecture notes uh, from SlideShare or any other site, provided it has a CC BY license, uh, edit it and 
re-upload it into the OER repository. And finally, you should agree to share under the UMS OER license. So that goes with that license is that what goes with license is that you cannot withdraw your article once you deposit it there. So these are something which you should be aware of before you deposit. I will guide you step by step to the process of depositing content. So if you are if you are depositing content, for instance, you are you have decided to deposit content and you're ready to deposit content, you should keep the article, for example, an article ready as an PDF file. You, you cannot deposit um, content which is very large. There's a limit for this. So that's why for your uh, video files, I suggested you use a link. And then you need to keep information ready, which is the author names, the hashtags or keywords, and the link. As well, if you have a video file, you need to keep a thumbnail image of the uh, video file ready, because that's what the system will require. Okay, so for video files, this is the step-by-step -step procedure. I will share these slides with you, which is also CCBY. So the slide which I'm going to share with you right now is a Creative Commons, attribution file so you can actually use that file or use that content again if you are if you are trying to deliver this same kind of uh, presentation to your faculty or your respective uh, department and so on and so forth so you can use this uh, same presentation okay so the, for video files you create the video file first you upload the video file at a publicly accessible database this is very important because the video file should be accessible publicly you have to select a CC by license. For example, YouTube has only two types of licenses. One is the uh, standard YouTube license. One is the CC by license. Vimeo, on the other hand, has multiple licenses. You can select any of the Creative Commons licenses. Then you have a link to the file. So the link should be deposited in the OER. And you should ensure that the file is always accessible, which means that you don't deposit in OER and then take down the YouTube video. Of course, in YouTube, they are very strict regarding copyright. So sometimes if your video contains any copyright elements such as music or other content, they may ask you to take it down. So in that case, the link will be broken. For audio files is the same. So for audio file, you can deposit it as a SoundCloud file in any or any other audio hosting service. And you can follow the same procedure for audio files as well. For lecture notes, you have to prepare your lecture notes using a specific format, which is known as the uh, format with the TASL attribution, and you convert to PDF. I will show you this TASL attribution because this is part of your metadata files. Okay, so now we will guide you through the process of the logging in. Okay, so I will go back and I will tell Nora she is uh, in the other room here at our office, and she'll be ready to assist you in case you have a difficulty with your registration. Okay, so this is for those of you who have not registered currently. I just zoom in this. So what you need to do is you need to first go into this button here, click register. After you click register, you key in your email address. This will be your UMS email address along with the ampersand at the rate of ums.edu.my. So this should be your email address and then you click on the register button. <laughs> now registration here is not automated because we are preventing, trying to prevent <coughs> people from outside UMS registering. So the registration is managed by our team here at the Center for eLearning. So Nora will, uh, Ozul Fadli will then grant you a registration uh, key. So after you register, you, you should get a prompt in your Email. So those of you who have not registered, because I cannot see everyone's name on the system, we uh, can please register now and obtain your registration ID. Because if you do it after the workshop, after this presentation, maybe uh, we'll have to check uh, the system again. So if you do it now, you'll immediately get access to the system. Once you register in the system, you will receive an email link to your in your UMS mail, and then you can proceed from that link. Okay, so I'll give you all some time to register. So while registering, I'll explain to you the process of the distribution or the deposit of content. Okay, so you can take around five minutes to register. I will just check the system simultaneously on the other terminal.
if you are you having any difficulty registering you can just uh, type a message in the chat window okay so once you have registered we will have to i will show you the step by step procedure for the next steps so you log in okay okay thank you thank you so once you register right you may have some additional problem which is depositing content so i will show you what the uh, the common problems which you may face when you deposit content because this is a technical issue so once you register you have to be assigned to what is known as a collection which is a faculty collection so please register now and then you try and deposit the content just follow through with me step by step and i will guide you through the process just give me a second i just log on to the terminal Okay, now once you're registered, you go to your registration page and you log in using your user ID and password. Now for this system, please do not use your password from your UMS. Use another password because this system is uh, independent by itself. So if you, if you use your system, your UMS password here, it may com get compromised. So please use a alternative password for the OER system. That's a suggestion for you to protect your security settings. Trying to log into the terminal from here, the admin terminal. So we're logging in. We will go through the process of the depositing new content. Okay, so I'm signing into my terminal here. Checking. Okay, now you, once you're signed in, you will see the different types of content categories. And if you have any difficulty here, I've created a video for you here. This video is accessible on YouTube and this gives you a step-by-step -step instruction as to how to deposit content in the OER repository, specifically video content, because most of us will have difficulty when it comes down to the video content. You have to upload a thumbnail and there's a step-by-step -step procedure. So you use this particular link and this QR code. You just click on the link, it should take you to the video. Now, in as I mentioned earlier, the content in the OER repository is stored in the form of the communities. Okay, you won't see faculty uh, listed here. It says communities OER at the rate of UMS, and then you will see your respective faculty listed in it. Now, why is this word community used? Is because we are using, if you look down at the bottom, we are using a engine known as DSpace. Now, uh, this D space is something which is con which enables this particular OER to be connected to the entire world. So anyone searching for any content from Saba and they write OER UMS and they search online in Google, they will find your content here in this repository. Now you can see a lot of content from certain faculties. For example, the Faculty of Business Economics and Account Accountancy is very active. They have a lot of content here inside. So it's e-articles, e-notes, educational videos, and so on and so forth. So you can look through that. You can browse through that. Then there is also a lot of content, significant amount of content from the faculties of the uh, science, social sciences and humanities. And also the, uh, for example, CENI, the art, uh, the arts, and so, uh, they put a lot of the content like the uh, the video files as well as the image files okay so this is the collection at the current level so what is it is encourage that each faculty deposit content this is because you, when we are talking about ums in the global uh, global context right? we need to look at how much we are contributing to the global community so that adds into our ties into our vision and mission of what i mentioned last time the globalization and the innovation so the more content you de uh, deposit here, the more the visibility of UMS will increase. And then, of course, we get the traffic associated with the traffic, meaning more web traffic and so on and so forth. Now, all of this actually ties into our rankings, what we call the visibility of the university. It ties into our ranking and reputation. So the more you deposit here, actually you're assisting uh, UMS in improving our global visibility. That's why we 
uh, ask you to deposit here. Okay, one it benefits you of course because people searching, for example, people who are working on on projects may want to get you involved, but and because you have some article in the OER, they may contact you directly for doing work on certain projects. Like some of our colleagues, they get uh, research grants from overseas because they are contacted directly for projects. So the OER is a good platform to publicize yourself and at the same time to assist UMS. So let's look at the content and how you create. So now that I've shown you the content, we go through a step-by-step -step procedure of depositing content. You can search for content here as well, or you can search the OER repository from Google or from any search engine. Now, the way you uh, deposit content, right? Okay, you look down, once you log in and you're registered, you'll see uh, something here known as submissions. You click on the submission button here. It's very small. The, this OER is not a fancy site with a lot of JavaScript. It's purposely, deliberately kept light. So it's accessible to everyone across the world. Okay, those, even those who have low connectivity can access this. So you go to my account and you click on submissions. Okay, now this is where those of you who are newly registered may have problems. That's why I'm asking you to register now. So I can help you with, or both of us, Nora and I can assist you with that particular problem, which is the non-assignment to collection. Now, you can only deposit content in your respective faculty. So, if you are from, for example, if you are from the Faculty of Science and Natural Resources, so you can only deposit in that particular uh, faculty. If you are from IPMB, IPB or IBTP, you can only deposit in those respective collections. You can't deposit outside your collection. So, sometimes what happens when you join uh, the system, it will ask you to assign you to your faculty. Okay, so please, uh, if you have any problem with this particular button, which is submission, inform uh, me, or you can uh, key into the chat window, and we will get back to you. We will resolve it for you. Okay. Now, the collections are actually categorized here. So this is a lot of demonstration of collections. So I will just guide you to the process. So let's look at how we start a new submission. So once you're in Submissions here, you go to this page and you have a start another submission. Now, once you select this start another submission, you will it will ask you to assign it you to a collection. Now I'm using an admin terminal here, administrator terminal, so you'll see everything. But if you look at your terminal, you should see your respective faculty. If you can't see your respective faculty, please, uh, prompt us in the chat. Okay, so Nora and I will solve it for you. So Nora is sitting outside with the admin terminal. She will assist us in uh, uh, assigning you to your faculty. Because some of you may not have that assignment when you first registered. Okay, now let's look at the uh, faculty list. I'll go to the example. I just used the center uh, Pusati Pavila Jan. I'll just use this as um, okay. I'm just going to go to my, uh, the center for e-learning because I'm using an admin terminal. I'm just going to deposit the lecture note as e-note. Let's uh, do let's do it now. So we go to e-note, okay, and then I go to next. Okay, now. The first item which you need to enter, I'm going to go through this slowly so that uh, you can all follow through or, and we'll share the recording with you so that you can do it with your content as well simultaneously. So the author, for example, I'll put my name here. Then I put, okay, so that's very simple. Now, if you have multiple authors, I will add my colleague's name. So I'll write, I add her name, which is, uh, I'll add my colleague's name, so she's the, okay, so I add this person's name. So that, then you have two authors for this. Now, the title of this will be OER, Instructable, call it an Instructable. So now that means, now suppose I'm no longer here in this uh, center, okay? And suppose somebody uh, wants to uh, download So somebody wants a OER instructable or an instructional guidelines, right? O OER guidelines, right? All they need to do is go to OER repository, 
and they and they just search OER guidelines at UMS and you can get uh, the content and you can just deliver the content as it is. Okay, so it's very simple to do it and it's a good way to share the content and you don't have to download it into your PC and keep it. Uh, you can just share it, uh, view it from here. Okay, so I just call it OER and I give it a date 2022. This is all, these are all optional. The system will not flag you for I guess 4th of July. Uh, uh, Dr. Nora, yeah, can you please ask? You can turn on your mic. Somebody has raised a hand. You can ask a question anytime you are free. Please turn on your mic and you can ask because I'm using two terminals here, so I cannot focus on one at a time. Do you have a question? One second. One second. You can ask a question now. I'm, I've turned on the speaker. Any question? Because I saw someone raise a hand. No, okay. Maybe it's uh, just a mouse click. So I just focus on. So the next one is the date of issue. So you have, and then you have publisher. Usually I just put University Malaysia Sabah. This is not because University Malaysia Sabah is not, doesn't refer to the publisher. It just makes it easier for the search engine to find it. So Google will find Moisley. So if you need a citation, you can add using any of the citation formats. Usually we don't use that for e-articles, but you can uh, cite yours as also. You can add whatever format you want. So it comes over here. So you just add your format here. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, you can just uh, turn on your, you know, I'm using the system uh, terminal here. So I cannot uh, see the chat simultaneously. So if you have any question, you can please turn on your mic and you can just turn on. Okay. So okay, this is a series report. Usually this one doesn't have a number unless you're doing uh, laboratory practical series one, series two, and so on and so forth. So that's a series report number. Identifies are the ISSN number or the ISBN number. Okay. Also the URL or EISS and OEISBN. Okay. So this is a number which you may have. But usually, uh, you know, okay, so I'll just uh, go off track slightly. There is something known as EISBN and EISSN. Okay. This is an E designation. This is generally given for the ebooks. Now, if you are publishing ebooks, usually very easy to publish ebook. There are software. And we can we also do IDP course on how to uh, prepare an ebook. There is a software which you can uh, use it. You can use online. It's a paid software, but we also have a software here which will enable us to generate your ebooks. Now, once you create an ebook, you can actually get a EISBN or an EISSN number for that book, and that is obtained from our national library. Purpustaka Negara will give you an EISSN. So you fill up a form, we submit it to the EISSN, or you can do it yourself. We can assist you with that. And then you get an EISSN or EISBN number for your book or your magazine. Okay, so some of you are faculty, you're producing your magazines, the Majala for every month or every quarter, you can actually have a EISSN number for that. Okay, and or an EIS, EISBN number if it's a book. Now this can be done and it's also considered for the Myra, it's considered as a publication. So this is a very good way to publicize your content. Once you have an ebook, Provided it's not being sold, you can uh, sold commercially, you can deposit it here at the repository. So this is an identifier for the EISSN. Okay, now comes the next part, which is the type of the material. So now uh, the type of material, there are many, many, many types. Okay, so we usually have the, let's, let's look at it. it's a lecture note. Let me look at that. So it's a, I can put it as a learning object. We can put it as a presentation. Learning object means it may be your lecture note with uh, assessment built into the lecture note. Okay, so then it will become a learning object. Sometimes lecturers may have a video which has a like um, interactive video. So that becomes a object. Okay, so you have the presentation. Now the language is generally English. It's United States, so we use English. We use British English, but in uh, this language, right? We don't have the language for the 
Basa, Malayu, we don't have that in that particular category. This is because we are using that D space and by default, these are the languages which are available in the system. Now, suppose you wrote an article in Basa, uh, Malayu, and then it has to be searched. Uh, it's Google will not search specifically for that. That is one of the disadvantage of this system. So you can, in that case, you can select other. Okay, we are trying to set it up, but I contacted the, uh, the D space people, but they say that is limited because it's a free software. It's only having that category of languages inside the system. Okay, now once you have created that, it goes to the next step. So you can give your subject keywords. These are which will be searched by the database. Uh, by the search engine. Also edit later on. And for example, this like this actual note is will be Korea. I just add a simple one. So just to show you how it's done. The sponsors. Now this sponsor is very useful. This again comes to how you can use this OER for your daily activities in terms of the research reporting. Now, all of us publish a report, a research report upon completion of the research, pro our, our research project. So at the end of example, you have FRGS grant or the KP, different kinds of KPT grants or even the UMS grant, we produce a research report. Now, this research report, generally we will PDF it and we will uh, submit it to the research management center. And then it's basically goes into their system and it, you may not access it or you, you will, you, after 10 years, you are in UMS and you may not, you want to read your old research report, right? Maybe you want to do a new project and you want to use that original data as a baseline. So, okay, so you need, so this is a good place to deposit your research report. So that is where the sponsor comes in. Now, if I write here the sponsor's name as, for example, the Ministry of Higher Education, KPTI, right here, then that becomes the sponsor, and then you can add your uh, code, the project code. So it's very important if you use the sponsor, you add your code of the research project. So that means anybody, anywhere from KPT, they can find your project. Maybe somebody is reviewing your project at a future date, or you have submitted a new grant, you still have evidence of that original grant in the system. So that's how you use the sponsor title. Now, description is a descriptive title, so you just describe your OER, or your content as you want to be. Okay, this is where you have to add your links. Suppose it's an ebook, we can't deposit the entire ebook in the system. If it's a YouTube link or any any video link or uh, Spotify, or we can add this link here. Okay, so you just copy and paste the link directly here. Now here you have to file. So I'm going to choose file. I just upload this file. So just give me some time. I will go to downloads. I just upload it for demonstration and then you give a description of the file. So I just say lecture notes and then I upload this file and add another. Okay. So have your file uploaded here. Now this file will appear as a PDF file in the system. Don't upload the PowerPoint files or the uh, other formats because they, if you go into the system and somebody downloads and they are reused, you cannot track the usage of that file. You know, in this one, we can actually track who's using the file because we can access the traffic report. Now, once your file is deposited over here, you must make sure before you do that, make sure that it does not have any copyrighted content, which means that I need to look through my file and check, did I use any copyrighted images and so on and so forth. Okay, so you can run a check on that and you can look, use this file once you have run a check. Okay, and then you go to next. Now it'll it'll give you a review the submission. So in this uh, step, right, it's like what you uh, do when you submit an article to a index journal. So you submit a journal, index journal, they will ask you to review everything, check all the stuff, check the authors, check if you want to correct, you can correct at this stage because once I click on the submit button, I can't actually uh, delete it. Remember that. So you have to be careful with all the content you have put up there. And okay, and I'm going to go down and I'm going to click save next. Then there's a distribution license. Now this license is something again, you should read carefully. Don't simply click on it because that's what happens when we download app, we click, accept all the end user license agreement. And then we click and we install the app and the app will extract the data from your phone or do some uh, run some malicious code. Okay, so that's what we can end up in. So that's why I read that distribution license. So it tells you what, how the work will be distributed and 
how UMS has exclusive rights. Okay. And after you finish everything, you click here, complete submission. Okay. If you don't want to uh, submit, you, you have to click here. I grant the license and you complete your submission. Now, once you click complete submission, this article will go into the immediately it goes into the uh, open space, which means that anyone who wants to find OER article, you just, you can try it yourself. Go on, go to Google and you can open a Google window and search for the article. You will find this article there. Okay. Simultaneously, what happens is that if you have, if you have permitted Google Scholar to uh, insert it into your list of citations or your list of articles published, it will come into your Google Scholar as well. Okay. So if you deposit a lot of OER, they'll end up in your Google Scholar, but they are not cited articles. They are just the, uh, they are not peer reviewed or what is known as the uh, articles which will be cited by others. It's just open OER articles. Okay, so you'll see it over there. If people cite your article, maybe you will get a citation there, but generally for OER, you don't see that citation appearing in Google Scholar. Okay, so, but it will turn up in your Google Scholar anyway. Now, once you have deposited this article over here, right? You can go to the submission page and you can see. So you have once finished submission and you will see if you have not, okay, you have all the submissions here. You can see this. Now, I, I don't have many submissions. This is just for demo. So you will see a lot of submissions by just which I demonstrate to the to all of you. So that's what you see. So I hope this is clear to you. Okay, now we'll just uh, give a short while for those of you who have problems with the system to raise your hand or you can uh, ask me, uh, or you can, I'll turn on my chat window so you can communicate with me or with over Nora to, if you have any problem, please, Highlight it, we will resolve it now. Okay, I just log into the chat. Any problems? Any issues related to submission? Anything you can just ask us now, uh, we will solve it for you. Okay. So I will go on to the creative commons because I want to show you how to create that license because the license is actually just a badge. Okay. So you'll see. Okay. If you look at the top of this thing, right? Okay. If you look at this OER, you can see at the bottom when I created this, there's a CCBY badge over here. Okay. That is just a sticker which I have pasted over there, but it indicates that the article is a CCBY content. Now, in addition to the CCBY, right, you have what is known as metadata file, okay, the MD uh, metadata is actually a content. Now, those of you who are from IT and who are aware of metadata is some, it's actually a, con for example, you have a picture, a photograph, you clicked in, for example, in Kota Kinabalu city, you clicked a photograph that contains certain metadata. If you have enabled your geolocation, it will contain your uh, the coordinates. If you have enabled everything, it will all the, it will even tell you about the camera type and the location and many other types of data are, are inside that as a metadata file. Now, for OER resources, you can create a metadata file. Yeah, let's go through the process of creating a license. So, when you go to the Creative Commons uh, website, okay, you will see. Um, icon here. It says share work. There's also use and remix, but let's look at share work. Share your work. Now, when you click share your work, it will ask you to create a Creative Commons license. Now, these licenses are not, uh, not like your copyright standard licenses. For the copyright, you'll have to file for a copyright with the MICO. For the uh, so you'll have to go to Penetbit UMS and they will help you to file a copyright and get your ISSN number. Or you'll have to, you can also file for the EISPN number alternatively. So this is a open license. Okay. Now, let's choose a license. So you go here and you click get started. Now, these licenses have metadata, which means that you can, you can display them as such. 
or you can, uh, if you have a metadata file, and if you're having, for example, a blog, you can insert the metadata file into your blog. So your, your blog will have its own license with the metadata file inside. So those, those of you all who use any of the blogging platforms, you can actually add your metadata into, you write an article on your blog post, you insert the metadata using your license, and then you copy the link and you can deposit it as UMS OER. So you get access from, so anyone searching the OER will also find your blog post with your article inside it. Now, this is how you select the license. So what you need to do is, all you need to do is click on the respective button here and the license is created automatically. So allow adaptations of your work to be shared. So you just click yes or no. Now, as you click no, the license become restrictive. Okay, so if you click yes, you can see a small green icon here, which is known as a free culture license. If you click here, it's the same, but if you click on commercial users of the work, no, the free culture license will disappear. So it'll say this is not a free culture license. Now, uh, some of you usually when you have face to face, they will ask, why should we create content and give it away freely Okay, on the OER system? The, the thing about the OER, the philosophy of the OER, if you look at the background is that we are not creating anything free because everything which we are creating is based on what do we call prior art? Okay, so we we are not actually so we, we think we are creating content. We are not creating content. We are simply uh, repurposing content. Okay, suppose I'm a, I'm delivering a, lec a lecture, for example, on biology or physics or chemistry. The lecture content is not something which I created. It's something I repurposed. I use the content online and I repurposed it. So it's not basically my content in terms of the ownership. So that's why the OER has. Uh, the philosophy of OER. In fact, even for your patent and your copyright, there's a limited span for it. For example, your copyright, of course, is until your lifespan, your lifespan, and then it you can actually uh, bequeath your copyright to your children. Okay, so you can pass your copyright in your will to the next generation. Okay, but there's a limit for that. Patents also have a limited life, uh, like you can only file patent for 10 years because all knowledge basically has to be repurposed and reshared. So that's why we say, uh, people ask, should we allow commercial use of your work? Then you say yes. Uh, that means you're creating content for other people who will use it free. Okay, so this is part of the modern, uh, the way the economics works. So that's, I mean, that's the way it is. So we just follow suit. Okay, now, so you have your license and everything is in place. So the license is created. You can copy and paste this license from here. You will see it here. Okay. Now, now comes the metadata file. So how do we ensure that you get attribution for your content? Now there is a, something known as the TASL attribution. Just as you have your, uh, we have our citation styles, uh, we have our Chica, uh, the, the um, APA, then the Harvard style and so on and so forth. Right? You have your citation style which tells the author, the date, the title, the volume and so on and so forth. In the case of Creative Commons licenses, we have to create a metadata. So this is based on a TASL attribution. So you have your title, the author, the uh, the, li uh, the license, and the source code. The source, I'll show you how it's done. So we use the TASL attribution. Okay. So this is where you key in your title. So you have your title. So example, your title was OER, OER lecture, for example. It's, I'm just giving an example. This, so, for example, if your uh, title was lecture on uh, quantum mechanics or electronics, you just typed here, lecture on OER, your name is attribution. So, use your same name as which you use in your publications. So, I'll just put, just use the example, attribute work to URL. Now, this is the attribution URL. So, this is the key in your www, the link. For example, your video link, you can put it over here. The source work URL, which is the UMS link. And any other permissions are there here, which you need to add to the URL. For example, you have some certain uh, element which you want to add permissions and your format of work. So you can click here. So is it audio, video, data set, or interactive? For example, this is a text, text file, and then you have your license mark if you have a license. Okay. So this is the content. So once you have this metadata file, you can click here and then the metadata file is generated here. Now, this metadata file, you can copy and paste inside your web page. Okay, so the metadata file follows your content. So that's how you do it. Now, if you're just copying it, all you need to do is you click here, you copy this and you paste it in your slide. 
So this is the OER lecture is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License. Now somebody who uses your video or your lecture note will have to cite that original source. You can see this on YouTube. In fact, because some of the YouTube videos are having a CC BY license. So people download that YouTube video and then they will reuse that video. And, but in your in the description, they will cite the original source. So this is a way by which we ensure that the content is shared and the authors are acknowledged because some, of course, many of us may not even care for acknowledgement at a personal level, but when it comes down to your career, you will still have to have acknowledgement to put on your CV. So that is a material aspect, but most of us who are academics will not even care for the, whether people attribute us or not, it's insignificant. But when it comes down to the practical aspect, please ensure that you get attributed or for your promotions and so on and so forth. You will not see that on your CV. It's documented. That's the way the world works. Even though some of us may want to be open and free with regard to knowledge sharing, but in the real world, we have to ensure that you get attribution. So this is one way you get your attribution. Now, if you look through this, right, there'll be, a, there'll be tons of work which you can find over here. There are image files. For example, I'll search for CC images. So if you are looking for content, I'll just put uh, IC integrated circuit. I just put just for an example, uh, and I look for integrated circuit and I look for images search. Okay, so you're searching, so integrated circuit image. So there are lots of uh, images here of integrated circuit. If you're doing electronics, you'll know what this is. So once you, for example, I want to use this image in my presentation, the circuit diagram, I click here. I click here and then I can see this image here over here. So this is a CC BY NC 2.0 license. So which means that this is a Creative Commons attribution non-commercial license, which means I cannot use, I can use this for education or preparing a poster, but I cannot use it in my lecture, which is generating an income. Now you will ask me, do people track all these? Of course, with today's advanced technology and metadata uh, files, you can actually track images, people can track images uh, using the encryption and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, people who are from IT will know this. So you can actually track this usage of images once you download them from the systems. There are multiple things which you can find here. You can even find videos. Okay. So click on this. For example, I have put up a lot of CC BY content. I say T and I click on videos, all content. You can find content here, videos, content here on by safety. Okay, so you go for conferences, you you upload content here. There are only certain rules which you need to up, uh, take care of when you deposit content in CCBY. One is the usage of people's face. Uh, you need their permission before you actually upload content here. So be careful with that because that's a flag. That's a, if you deposit content without the permission of the person. For example, your students or even your class, you snap the picture and then you deposit in a OER repository. Uh, it can create legal issues for you. Okay, so be careful with that uh, element of the education business. Okay, so this is about the OER. Do you have any uh, comments or anything you want to say or ask? So suggestion, install a statistical button data. Okay, thank you very much. So we are, we will ask, you see what happens with this OER system is if you need the specific information on the downloads and upload, you can ask us and we will ask the JTMK for the data and we can share it with you. Generally, we share it with all our e-learning coordinators during the meetings. So we have an e-learning coordinator meeting, we'll share the data. Now, the reason why uh, we cannot share it on that on this terminal itself on the D space is because the software option is not there for that button. We can't add the button. This is the what we have. Uh, we can't modify this much because it's uh, the way it has been built. Uh, the developer has built it this way. So we can try and add that. One minute, I just check the chat window.
Just check chat one second. For commercial executive course offered by AMS, how would CC ND work? Okay. From Dr. Nora, we get a copy of it. Yeah. Okay. So the, for the first one, right? Okay. For the second one is, do we get a copy of your PPT? You can just go on the OER repository and you can download. It's free to download. So you can reuse it as well. So I made it like that. So actually, um, I don't even want attribution, but I made it that way. So you get uh, access to the content and you can reuse it. Okay. So you can go to OER. So the first one for commercial executive course offered by EMS, how would you use CC? So, okay. For that one, don't, don't deposit. If it's a commercial course, you're going to, you're charging a fee for it. Please don't deposit it at the OER because once you deposit it there, you have actually overridden that licensing for the commercialization because the CC or uh, the OER is NC, non-commercial. Okay. Uh, install a statistical. Okay. okay. Dr. Madhirin has asked for the statistical button data. Okay. So that one we have to ask JTMK whether we can install that or not, but usually the data is not shared. Okay, so again, I'm telling, I'm reiterating this. If you see that your work has some commercial application implication in the future, then don't deposit it. That, that because it'll, it will, uh, like, as I said, there's something known as prior art. Prior art means all other work, which has been published prior to your work. So if you cite, if you already put your work as prior art, and then you claim ownership for something like a patent. For example, I develop a new type of fertilizer and I said, okay, I will put it at OER. Then I want to file a patent for the composition of the fertilizer. So I go to MIPO and I file. They will immediately go through the database and say, oh, that's already open access. So you can't file the patent. So this happens to our lecturers. And this is why I'm trying to prompt you or flag you to that, but specific aspect. So those of you who are doing commercial work, right? Even photography or writing poetry, if you want to, uh, or writing a script, for a play, if you want to commercialize that or copyright it, please don't deposit it here. Okay, deposit it here, even part of it. Don't deposit it in the OER. Okay, that's just to keep you. Uh, I mean, I want to keep you updated so you don't do that and end up uh, like with a flagging from the MIPO. Okay, so if you have any issues with the system, you can inform me now before or else I move on to the MOCs for the new lecturers. So the, the lecturers who are old, old meaning by old, I mean, not old in age, those who have been here at UMS will probably be aware of the MOCs, but I will show you the next, I will move on to the next part, which is the MOCs at UMS. Okay. Any questions you can ask me now, else I move on. Okay, try and access the presentation at the OER and you can download it from there. Okay, we move on to OER. From to the next type of OER, which is actually a MOC. So MOC is actually a type of the OER because that's why they are called massive open online courses. Now, some of you all may have attended, some of you all may have even developed and some of you all may have, uh, be intending to develop the MOCs. Okay, let's look at the MOC itself. I log out from here and I, okay, this is UMS MOC. So again, you will ask me as a new academic staff at UMS, what is this UMS MOC? Where does it fit in to our, with our career? Like where does it fit in within our scope of our job as an academic in UMS? Now we are all involved in teaching and learning as part of our job profile. We have a specific profile related to teaching and we teach and uh, supervise and so on and so forth. Now, the MOCs are also a form of teaching and learning, but they extend beyond the university. Now, where does this come into play in the entire system? Now, MOCs have one, the first one is basically become, their MOCs have become part of the educational ecosystem again okay, many universities especially the private universities use the mocs as a means for reaching out to students so it's a kind of a marketing strategy for the private universities for public universities it's a matter of reputation so we use the mocs as a means to reaching out to the public and getting access to different uh, strata of society so this can include the alumni 
as well as potential students and the adult learners who are lifelong, what they call the lifelong learners, they may want to partake of a MOOC and then uh, integrate that MOOC into their CV or into their curriculum as a uh, credit. Okay, so that's where the UMS MOOC comes into the picture. Now, we have each year, we produce a certain number of MOOCs and currently in UMS, we host this MOCs on our smart learning management system. So if you go to our smart UMS, you will find some MOOCs which have been hosted by our staff. For this year, the MOCs were designated by faculty. So each faculty has been assigned a certain number of MOOCs in order to be created at the platform. And they will submit these MOOCs for review and the MOOC will be created by the respective lecturers and deposited at the Smart V3 and then it's access. In fact, uh, some of the MOOCs we were tracking the traffic online. Some of the MOOCs have up to 300 students. Okay, So those may be the uh, languages, the English language and the uh, languages, uh, language stu uh, studies uh, have around 300 plus registered users for MOOCs. Now, these are not uh, students. They are also some alumni as well because our alumni have access to our platform. Now, what is this MOOC? A MOOC is actually a massive open online course. And again, it's a kind of OER because it's an open system. And the MOOC is shared on international platforms. It's accessible across the world. So in the context of UMS, so within our framework, it fits into our vision of globalization. It caters to content. If you recall in the previous lecture, I've mentioned about something known as an adaptive learning environment. For instance, someone comes into your class and they are not aware of certain concept in physics or chemistry or social sciences, and you want to introduce them to that concept, but you don't want to interrupt your whole class and change your curriculum for that particular student. This is where the MOOC comes in. You can ask the student, if you want to learn more about this, please take register for this MOOC, complete the MOOC, and when you complete the MOOC, you will understand that particular context. So that's the, that particular concept. So that's where the MOOC comes into the picture. So that's one aspect. The second one is for alumni and the public. Now, in some courses or some programs, the alumni may require lifelong learning as the technology changes. So for that one, you can use MOOCs as well. The other one was income generation. Currently at UMS, we don't have a platform for income generation of MOOCs, but that was the long-term vision of UMS is that all the MOOCs will eventually become a source of income for the respective uh, faculties, lecturers, and the university in general. Of course, that rate, or oh, the distribution of that income is just uh, decided by the uh, Bendahari or the Treasury, but uh, the bursar's office. But currently, we don't have that uh, system in place because we do not have income generating MOOCs. Let's bring you up to date. Okay, now what is the MOOC and what is how do we design it? So previously we looked at ADE, right? So we analyze the situation, we design, develop, implement, and we evaluate. So that's our traditional approach to designing content for uh, education. So we teach. So we first we analyze the situation. Okay, now suppose I want to create a MOOC for the current situation. I will analyze the market first to determine what is what are the MOOCs which are required. For example, uh, people may want very uh, detailed MOOCs on how to write specific codes for programs or how to use artificial intelligence to improve your financial profile. So these are topics which are trending now. So if you look at the MOOCs which are trending now, most of them are related to self-help MOOCs. Okay? So they are related, for example, your self-help may be from meditation to improving your financial profile to psychological awareness and so on and so forth. So there are multiple MOOCs or even there are MOOCs which will help you to generate income using different revenue streams. So these MOOCs are being promoted. Now, if you look at the general aspect of MOOC uh, design, if you analyze what's happening in the world, you will notice that most of the MOOCs are not related to the traditional uh, learning ecosystem. For example, there'll be MOOCs on physics, chemistry, biology, and so on and so forth. But these are mostly uh, taken by school students or people who want to uh, like um, enroll for certain exams and certifies for certain exams. So these, but the MOOCs which are generally required uh, used by the public are related to topics which are not in the traditional curriculum. And these topics can be linked, for example, in the future to what is known as the micro-credentialing system. So micro-credentials are actually short or small courses 
which add up together, they are, they, you can compile many micro credentials to create a credential and then you can incorporate it into your transcript. So this is the general aspect, which is the long term vision of the MOOC uh, system or the MOOCs platform. Now, the topics for MOOC are generally uh, free, but as far as possible, try and link your MOOC to your subject matter. This is because in the university, you are being nurtured or cultivated in order to evolve into a subject matter expert. Okay, some, some of us, of course, do administrative work and we move away from the subject, but some more, a majority of us will be subject matter experts. So that is why your MOOC have, have to be based on your subject matter. So as you, for example, if you're a individual who has um, expertise in specific language, for example, traditional ecological knowledge or traditional languages, you become a subject matter via your MOOC. So your MOOC has a very large audience. So these MOOCs can be used as a basis for expanding your reputation in that field. So then you become a subject matter expert, which is what is the aim of being in the university is as an academician. So this is something which you have to decide based on your expertise. Now for MOOCs are generally of a short duration, which is about maybe four weeks because they involve a lot of manpower, but you can also extend the MOOCs over a large uh, duration, which, which means that some MOOCs may be going for a long time. Maybe there are 12 MOOCs over a period of one year in which you uh, involve students for 12 lectures. It may be like that, or it can be a short MOOC generally for four weeks. And then you have levels of difficulty. So you have beginner, intermediate and advanced MOOCs. Okay, so generally for MOOC, when we do the MOOC design, when we do our AD uh, for MOOC, we actually look for how many weeks, how many assessments, are they instructor-based automated, which means that you can have interactive videos in which the, is the assessment is automated. And even in our learning management system, which is our smart tree, we can actually automate it to some extent to set up a logical design. So a student will access one content, only when they complete that content and they achieve a certain score, they will move on to the next content. So these things can be done in our system routinely. Okay. So the next one will be your automated assessment, which is generally done for the quiz in which a score is achieved by a student, which is an objective quiz. And finally, you have certification. So these are things which you need to look into before you design your MOC. So for uh, paid MOCs, duration is not an issue because based on experience with MOCs, so I have conducted some MOCs uh, online. So usually if the MOC will is free, there will be a high dropout rate. So there's a low completion rate and a high dropout rate because it's free, so everyone joins in and then they will drop out early. So three MOOCs. So what I would suggest to you to, in order to uh, encourage yourself, Usually try and develop what are known as the paid MOCs. So paid MOCs is where students will actually pay for the commercial MOC. So they will have to attend MOC and they will have to pay for that uh, MOC and then you will generate an income. So someone asked me a question in the chat earlier about the commercial uh, courses. Definitely all these commercial courses can be converted into MOCs, but these are not open MOCs. They are open for users in terms of the content, but when it comes on to certification, the user will have to pay for the certification. Okay, so that's how the MOCs are marketed because hosting an MOC for the university is not cheap. Okay, we have to pay for the server space, we have to pay for the bandwidth and the, every, and the cloud storage and so on and so forth. So it's not cheap. So if we offer it free, uh, there are questions related to the return on uh, on the investment ROI, what is known as the ROI. So as far as possible, I would suggest that you develop paid MOCs. Now what goes into an MOC? So the first one, it will be the content itself. So the uh, content of course has to be something which is uh, created by the user, which means that you cannot use copyrighted content in your MOCs. Of course, some of the MOCs do use copyright content, but then they pay the uh, a royalty to the original copyright creator. For example, if you are a very good speaker and you want to utilize somebody else's content for your MOCs, you can you can uh, down you can buy the content or you can obtain a license from the original content creator and use that as part of your MOCs. 
But generally what we do is we have uh, video lectures. Now for video lectures, those of you who are interested in uh, developing your video lectures, you can contact us, any one of us, Nora Azul, myself or Eugenia at the Center for eLearning. Okay, we have a studio over here and we can facilitate your recording. So you can come in with your content and you, rec you can record your content over here, but make sure that you have an appointment with our technical staff because they need to assist you in the process of video recording. We also need to uh, guide you regarding your slide uh, formats and layouts okay? because there are some technical element of that. So if you, but if you're interested in the first part, which is the video lecture creation, you can ask us. The next one is the laboratory session. Some lecturers who conduct Amali or laboratories, they do have a laboratory uh, tutorial. So for that they either live stream or they will photograph or video record their uh, laboratory session. Then you have B-roll footage, which means uh, we record a lot of stuff. For example, your lecturer who's doing field work, you have B-roll footage. So you call it a B-roll. The A-roll is the one which you uh, use for video. B-roll is something which you record and you can store this and you can edit it and you can share it on your, on your MOOC. Stock footage and music and other content. So usually the stock footage is something which we have in our database and music is something which we also have in a uh, database of the open uh, openly licensed music. Okay, we can't use copyrighted music for uh, MOOCs because it is uh, again, copyright issues. So the, usually for the MOOC, the content of our lecture will be around 10 to 20 minutes maximum because for, for the MOOC, unlike conventional lecture, the MOOC lectures are very specific to a particular topic. So we'll only deliver the uh, content within 10 to 20 minutes and that's it. So it'll be one concept or one learning outcome or even a part of a learning outcome for the lecture. The, then the learning outcome usually for each lecture is only one or maybe you will have uh, four or five lectures and each two lectures will share one learning outcome. It should be specific to a topic and as far as possible for MOCs, you should avoid digression from the topic. What this means is that uh, when you're speaking on a topic, you use, for example, you have a topic, you have an analogy, use only that much. You don't digress from the topic and go into other uh, like correlated issues because then it will move away from the MOOC because generally the audience for your MOOC will be someone who is, wants to focus only on one element. They don't want to learn. For example, if you are teaching them how to install a solar panel and how to wire the inverter for the solar panel, they only want to learn about the solar panel and how to wire the inverter. They are not interested in uh, the trends of solar panel in the world. They don't want that part. Okay, So if you, if you do that kind of video where you move away from the topic, you'll have a dropout rate from your MOCs. So they want very specific. In fact, if you analyze YouTube videos, the uh, retention, what we call retention for video time is basically uh, how you how long you hold the interest of the audience and the viewer. So if your audience, if you do not focus on the topic, your audience will move away from that particular MOC. And so that's why we have, so that's the, some of the things, elements which we do when we design the video. Now the assessment is usually done by automated systems because we cannot, uh, for example, you have 1000 students in your MOOC from across the world and you have to assess 1000 assignments within a, a week. You can't do that manually. So usually for the assessment of content uh, on MOOCs, it's done automatically using an objective such as a quiz. If you are doing a MOOC for a select audience, for example, some MOOCs are high quality MOOCs, they will have a instructor who will come in on live okay so they will only have for example 20 students and the instructor is live face to face move for that one you can take in a written or video assignment so it's easier for the lecturer whenever you have fewer students because there are some MOOCs which are premium MOOCs they will offer direct interaction with the instructor so you pay based on the instructor's uh, reputation and the expertise now for students interaction that's in a MOOC there is no hybrid learning environment everything is done in a open system which is online there's no face to face in a MOOC so usually we have for some MOOCs you'll have four lectures of instruction you may have one lecture where you have a live session like a webex session you interact with the students you uh, they ask questions and you respond and the rest is done via forums and feedback so some MOOCs usually have a live uh, session with Q&A. Okay, now, now comes the issue of certification. 
Now, let's look at certification from the international context and the national context. Now, if you look at the MOOCs conducted in, for example, in Silicon Valley, okay, by the Coursera and the other service providers, they will actually have a certification, which is a blockchain digital certification. Now, what has made the MOOCs uh, dominant in uh, Western market, for example, in Europe and the US and all that, is because of the fact that industry recognizes the MOCs. So the, the, the standard of the MOOC is so high that some, someone like Microsoft or Google will recognize that MOC because of the certification and because the content or the uh, developer or the content creator has, or the institution has basically maintained a very high standard for that MOC. This includes the, uh, the proctored examination. So usually if the MOOC has high value, it means that the examination will be proctored, online proctored examination, or it will be a examination whereby the student undertakes the MOOC, but the examination is conducted in a face-to-face -face setting. So that ensures that that MOOC is not compromised. So institutions offer the certificate based on the completion of the MOOC. So generally for MOOCs, we have two types of certificates. One is the certificate of Completion, which means you completed the examination and you achieved a certain score, for example, 90% and above. And one is certificate of attendance, where you attended all the sessions, but your examination score is lower than the standard. So you have criteria for certification of MOOCs. So once you complete a course, you are basically awarded the certificate. And the certificate is generally via, uh, it is issued using a blockchain. So it's a digital certificate and you have a blockchain, so you, it's uh, certified digitally, okay? So these things are done. In UMS, we are requesting at this stage because we don't have access to the digital certification. We request the respective faculties to issue the certificates, okay? This is because earlier we used to conduct face-to-face -face courses in each faculty as part of the income generation in each faculty. So in that case, the director of the faculty is to issue the certificate. So for the MOOC, we are recommending for this current phase of the MOOCs, this is what we recommend. Now, the MOOC involves a lot of work. So there's a content creation and you have to do a lot of course monitoring and course certification. So you must make sure that, for example, if you conduct a MOOC, you try and conduct it when, they, when you have a semester break, if it's a live MOOC, because you'll still have, to, even though the MOOC is online and it's running, you still have to monitor it and you have to issue the certificates. You, you can automate the MOOC using the uh, features of Moodle and you can allow the learner to learn at their own pace. Okay. So this is how a basic MOOC will look like. For example, if you decide to do a basic MOOC of five weeks in which you have five lectures, you can have five quizzes. Uh, so each lecture will have its own quiz. You have a learn, learner driven uh, delivery system, which means that if your uh, student decide to take the MOOC in one uh, day, a Saturday or Sunday or a weekend, they can actually complete the whole MOOC in one day. So the learner decides the pace of the MOC and you issue them a certificate after completion. So these are the elements of the MOC. Now, if you are doing an advanced MOOC, which is a MOOC, which is like, for, for example, you have your beginner's MOOC, then you have an intermediate and you have an advanced MOOC for high learners who want specific instruction, you can actually use live lectures and you can then have a written assessment. Okay. That's the background of the MOOC. Now, how do we develop a MOOC at UMS and what, what do we do at the Center for eLearning? Because we actually currently have a review system. So we have uh, reviewed certain number of MOOCs and we have issued them a reviewer's report and the process is going on. So I'll describe the process to you at UMS so that you are clear because you may be new and then you may not be aware of the process of MOC development at UMS, which may be different from the institutions from which you have joined, like you have been working with before. So what we had developed with at UMS is in collaboration with the um, Commonwealth of Learning, which is uh, one of our partner institutions, we have developed what is known as a course template. Now this course template is based on their standard. So we have just adopted it for UMS. So we adopt that course template. So this course template, you need to download it from the uh, website. We can share it with you. 
all your e-learning coordinators will have access to this template so you can request them for the template now when you decide to do or develop a MOOC, the first thing you need to do is to consult with your e-learning coordinator so at the center for e-learning we will assist you in the entire process of developing the MOOC from content creation to the uh, upload onto the smart system and so on and so forth. But the original, the initial decision is based on your e-learning coordinator. Please don't approach Center for e-learning directly for the MOOC proposal. You have to go through e-learning coordinator. We have done this in order to ensure that each faculty uh, is given the authority to decide the number of MOOCs which come out from that respective faculty. And there is a specific, uh, how do you say, a specific target or a KPI for each faculty. So this is known by the e-learning coordinator. Okay? So that's what you need to do first. The next one is you submit the course template to PEP. Again, once you have obtained permission from your director and your, or your dean and your e-learning coordinator, just submit your completed course template and appoint two reviewers. Uh, we will submit the template to the two reviewers for review. And after you, uh, after it's reviewed, we the reviewer will submit recommendation. The lecturer will modify it based on the reviewer's recommendation, and then we deploy it at the smart UMS. Now, why are we going through this entire process is because we want to ensure the quality of the MOCs. We, if, for example, if we let it free, there's no reviewer. Later on, when we have an audit, they will, uh, the auditor will ask us, was it reviewed? And if there were no reviewers, we have to respond to the questions from the auditor. And generally, it's not correct not to have a peer reviewer for a MOC. Now, again, I'm going to share this slide with you. Uh, I will ask Nora to share it with you. So this is the course template. Uh, you can click on a link and you will have access to the course template. Okay, I will ask Nora to share the course template with you. So once you submit it to PEP, the course template, it goes to the director. Again, we follow the we follow with that procedure, and we will appoint. Uh, we will ask you to appoint uh, to give the names of reviewers, okay? Which we will appoint. So please appoint a reviewer who is well versed in your area of expertise, who is from your area of expertise. We will submit that template to that reviewer to make remarks on the MOOC. So. Sometimes the reviewer may not be from your field, but they will still have an idea of what should go into a MOC. So the reviewer will be appointed with an appointment letter from the EP. So after two weeks of review, you will receive the modified course template, just as a normal uh, publication, which you submit to a journal, and you can uh, in incorporate the reviewer's recommendations, or you can rebut if you feel that the reviewer has been very, uh, how do you say, if you have not understood your content, you can rebut the reviewer, but then again, you have to go back to the reviewer. So the reviewer will generally review your content and they will recommend changes. If not, you just proceed with your book. Sometimes the reviewer will say it's okay because all your content has been aligned to the course learning outcomes. Okay, so you can improve the course and then you're free to upload it. So once you decide that all your content is ready, your, lecture, your videos are ready, your assessments are ready, you ask us to create a link for you. So we will create a course, what is known as a course instance, which means that we will generate a URL, a URL for you, for your MOOC. That URL you can share with your students and they can use that URL with the password to access and register for your MOCs. So how we work with, uh, because our MOCs at UMS are assigned by faculty based on the KPI, what we will do is we will assign the MOC under your respective faculty. That way you get the credit and your faculty gets the credit for that MOC. And now once the MOOC is in the system, right, we have some MOOCs running currently from different faculties. Uh, specifically, we are monitoring one from the PPIB. So the PPIB MOOC is very popular because it has about 300 plus users. I have, we have checked it. So, okay, thank you very much for sharing the template. Thank you. So you can you can click on the link, download the template into your system and you can study it. I will go through it. So this will be, the lectures will be mo uh, monitored by the respective faculty. So the lectures, right, when you, when you deliver your MOOC, if you are delivering live lecture, I would recommend when you're starting MOOC, don't use live lecture because it is going to raise, it's going to increase your workload. So the first MOOC, try and do it with an automated system. We can guide you how to set it up. 
and you deliver it and you can issue the certificate under a faculty. Okay. If you have any technical issues as normal, you can contact us at the PEP help desk. Now, some of the lecturers have asked me this question previously is can we deliver, for example, four lectures in your 14 weeks? You can deliver four lecture, convert that into MOOCs or a student attends a MOOC. The answer is yes, you can deliver it, but you need to in, in, uh, in, uh, insert that information into your course file. Okay, so if your table 4.2, insert that so that the first four lectures are conducted by the MOOC and then you give a link to that MOOC. So you'll have your CLOs aligned to your course. So don't conduct the MOOC as if you're doing it as part of your course, don't do it as a standalone MOOC. Integrate it with your CLOs. Again, for this one, it's because it's very uh, delicate or it's, it requires specific alignment. You can contact us at PEP and we'll, uh, we will guide you as to how to align it to the uh, larger course, the mega course, so that it does not uh, clash or it's not too divergent from the original topic and the original CLOs. Okay, so for the MOOC, uh, generally we uh, market it using social media. So you can um, Analyze, we can uh, basically get statistics or marketing. So we market it using uh, social media and then we can track the number of views. For example, you can create a video on YouTube. You can market the video and you can track the uh, statistics for that video to find out who's the audience and where it reaches and so on and so forth. The next one is do not give free access to MOOC. So don't make it free for all. Make sure that at least they, at least if they don't pay for it, at least they register for the MOOC. Or you make sure that they register or they email you. So it's not like considered because you have spent a lot of effort in creating that book. So don't uh, devalue yourself by giving it free. Okay, so uh, that's the way. Because although free is good, we are here to share. But based on the uh, experiences from MOC, this is based on the research from MOCs. Generally, if something is given free, no one appreciates it. The value of that. That is human nature. Okay, so so don't give it away free. Make it something which is uh, they need to, for example, email. So you have your advertising uh, a poster. Email me if you want to accept for the password. So you generate a password and then you only provide it to the um, to those who want who are interested. So the MOOC quality, of course, again we follow the AD. So after we uh, analyze, design, develop, implement, and evaluate. We will actually have an evaluation of the MOOC. So if I created a MOOC in 2001, for example, or two, sorry, 2020, I will uh, view the feedback because after the MOOC, we ask feedback from the students, improve the quality for the subsequent MOC version. So we get feedback, we improve the quality of the MOOC and we uh, make it sustainable. So that's how it goes on. If you don't do the MOOC quality improvement in the today's uh, challenging uh, environment, the MOOC will actually lose its value. So the MOOCs, generally those who are very popular online, they actually updated frequently. Okay, now for the technical aspects, for recording lectures, you can uh, record it as our, at our iStudio system. It's installed, fully installed now. So you can come here and you can record it. You And then for editing, uh, we generally request the lecturers to prepare the lecture as such. So for this technical aspect, I will be conducting a separate uh, training for you uh, in the IDP system. There's a short training and then we'll do a hands-on face-to-face training at the system at our uh, e-learning studio here. So those of you who are ready can come and start recording. All you need to do is bring in your lecture on a USB drive or you can even access it online and you can uh, deliver it here and we'll record it for you. So there are certain techniques. They are not very difficult to learn about how to record and how to use your voice and things like that and how to format your slides so that we will train you once uh, during our next IDP course. It's also a face-to-face -face course. Okay, so if you have any questions about the MOOC and how it's done, you can ask me now. Okay, so I will show you some examples of a MOOC at the COL. Let me just show you. You can post any questions you have. I will show you. Uh, Okay, there are multiple sites at which you can uh, view MOOCs. Okay, so this is a MOOC for development. It's a free uh, MOOC, so there are MOOCs here. In fact, these MOOCs are quite good in terms of those of you all who are studying instructional design or those who are pedagogy or e-learning can actually access this over here. So these are MOOCs which are free. The thing about these MOOCs is that they, they are having a 
specific date on which they are conducted. So this MOOCs will be, for example, you have a four week MOOC, it will be open for four weeks. They will keep the lesson open for four weeks. You complete the MOOC and they will issue you with a digital certificate. After the MOOC has been completed, it will be archived. So for example, you have digital learning and teaching. This MOOC, right, is archived. Okay. So this is actually um, conducted by an expert. It is free, but once it's archived, you cannot get certified. So if you want to get a certificate, like many of us have got certificates from uh, COL, you can conduct the MOOC over here. You can actually um, register for these MOOCs here. So there are uh, multiple MOOCs. For example, you have Introduction to Tech. This is a good MOOC, Introduction to Technology and Mobile Learning. Of course, now it's archived, I think, so it's archived. So if it's not archived, you can access it because sometimes they will, even though the MOOC is archived, sometimes they will relaunch the MOOC. So if once it's relaunched, it will come here, it'll appear here on the top. So these are the current live courses. So introduction to monitoring and evaluation is here. So this is the MOOC. So it tells you about the MOOCs. So generally, once your MOOC is in the our learning management system, you will have your course description and so on and so forth. This one, we will assist you in developing that. Okay, so this is the instructor and so on and so forth. So they, this is like a like a post synopsis on your MOOC page. Okay, so this is the MOOC template. Those of you who are interested in uh, developing the MOOC on your own, as I said earlier, please consult with your e contact your e-learning coordinator. Suggest your title and then you go through that process and then you approach e-learning center will issue a letter for the MOOC development. So this is the title of your MOCs. You can just go through this template and read uh, this in the and use my uh, lecture, this, the current PowerPoint which I have shown you. I will share that PDF with you as well. You can use that as a guideline for the MOOC. Okay? So this tells you about the pre-planning requirements, the core elements, the syllabus, course timeline, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's all self-explanatory. Post structure. I want to go into the table so that you and I explain the table to you because this is sometimes. So this is usually the title of the course, subject, and so on and so forth. The schedule. If you are conducting a MOOC during a scheduled date, for example, during semester break. Okay, all this should be keyed in. But what we look at is this one. So this is the one which you need to give the detail. The other one is self-explanatory. I'll just explain this to you. So your course has to have learning objectives. So now when you're doing a MOOC, like as a part of a larger course, you need to have a one learning objective from the, for example, 14 weeks have got three learning objectives or three learning or LOs. So you have uh, three LOs. But you select only one or two for the MOCs, and then you have you can sub categorize them. Then you have the week wise description of the course content. So each one will have a lecture synopsis and the course detail. Now it will help a lot. In, it, it, you don't require it, but in this week one outcome, it helps a lot. For example, if you have the video already uh, re made, so you insert a link up to the video and a link to the lecture notes. So this will help the reviewer. They will they can go through your video and they can view your content. Then you have your activities here, which will be the assignment and so on, and the assessment. So this is the actual content, which will be here. Okay, faculty coordinator. Okay, who, somebody has a chat window? Check the chat. Please assign the faculty coordinators to the MOOC at Smart2UMS. Okay. Yes. Yes, uh, Dr. Madhirin, you have to, we have to always assign the faculty coordinator book at UMS. Okay, okay, you want to have it on the website? You mean you want to have the name of coordinators on the website? Is that what you mean? Yeah, just a, a admin, admin manager, no, just a participant only. Cannot, cannot okay, okay, okay. You want to become, you means you want the e-learning coordinator to be assigned as manager? Yeah, just to create the template first and maybe after that, easy for review to comment over there. Or is a, okay, okay. maybe it's uh, in that, in the smart system. Yeah. Because now you check just a participant only. You cannot manage just a. Uh, Dr. Madhirin. Yeah. 
okay okay i, I check i'll later i check this so you, you want uh, the person to be assigned as manager yes for the respective faculty is it for okay, us okay. to dominate okay. and after that maybe we can review the courses thank you okay thank you dr madhavan okay so i will note that down in the future we will uh, not even not in the future in the current courses we will make sure that the faculty coordinator is also part of the moc right as one of the uh, contents so they can review okay we'll do that okay i will note that down so these are the outcomes learning outcomes and so this is the important part of the of the particular moc the rest is self explanatory so you can fill it up and so you have four weeks uh, or maybe you can add more weeks and then that's about the course template okay you have any questions you can take them uh, from you now one minute i open the chat now one sec you can actually turn on your mic no problem i can okay i'm chatting the chat faculty coordinator uh, yes can adjunct professors lecturers also do mooc with pp uh adjunct professor means someone who's in uh, not from ums i think the because the moc is with okay suppose you are doing uh, the moc using ums platform the main lecturer has to be from ums the main uh, lecturer but if you need additional support you can have a adjunct or a professor from another institution to assist you with that but again for that one you will have to have some kind of an agreement with that particular institution or lecturer following the ums uh, guidelines okay. you can have additional faculty on your mooc so if you uh, if you all are, if you all come for the next training which will be face to face i'm limiting it to few uh, because of the because we are afraid of the infection and covid things like that so we limited it but you can apply in the idp for the next training and uh, which will be conducted face to face for that training right we will get you involved or engage in the video lecture and the video recording so based on the demand for it we will expand it we will allow more and more staff to come in okay so please go to the idp i think the bsm will have that course uh, in somewhere in august and september so it's two two times in which we train you to use uh, do videography basic videography record your lecture and take it back okay so if you have any questions i am free to take or else we will end the session so we will record your name i will ask uh, nora one second i will ask nora to uh, i just go to the next office and ask them to record your don't log out we will record your uh, data Okay, so Nora has already recorded your data for the IDP points. Okay, so if you feel that you want to ask questions, you can stay because I'm online, or else you can leave. Thank you very much for your participation, and we look forward to actually assisting you to develop MOC. So this is the this was just an introduction to MOC and OER. So if you have any difficulties, especially with the system, please contact Nora or Zul or myself or Juan Eugenia. Okay, so thank you very much for your participation.